Bueno, bienvenidos a todos. Eh, vamos a tener ahora una sesión en inglés. Uh, so I'm going to speak in English. Welcome everybody and welcome uh, our panelists. We have a really high level uh, panel today. We have people from five different continents. Uh, all of them have a lot of experience in community-based tourism and indigenous tourism, and they will share their views on uh, regarding uh, their experiences and how they are living this uh, situation. Uh, so I'm going to leave the floor to Aureli. Aureli is the representative of the World Indigenous Tourism Alliance in Europe, and she will be the moderator of, of this session. So Aureli, uh, you can start this session, which uh, will, will be really interesting for our audience as well. Thank you very much, uh, Pablo, and uh, I wanted to give a spe special thanks to uh, the co-travel uh, team uh, for organizing this online event. Uh, thank you to the interpreters also for the great support for the translation in Spanish. And uh, of course, our five speakers who will uh, share their views on community-based tourism uh, according to their own territory, traditional land, or indigenous ancestral lands. Um, our speakers embody diversity in indigenous and local communities, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome them, uh, especially in this very difficult situation that we are living at the moment regarding tourism. Um, so first I would like to uh, introduce uh, Anina Sandberg. Um, Anina is the uh, CEO of uh, Visit Natives, which is a tour operator uh, based in Finland and working with Masai Hadza Bay in Tanzania and Sami people in Norway. We also have uh, Peter Richards, uh, who is a consultant at uh, International Trade Center uh, between UK and Myanmar. Welcome, Peter. Um, we also have Judy Kefrakona, uh, who is the director and senior consult consultant of sustainable travel and tourism agenda. Uh, welcome with us, uh, Judy. Um, then we'll welcome Robert Taylor. Uh, Robert is the director of the Western Australian Indigenous Tourism Operators Council. Um, and at least we have Keith Henry, um, and Keith is uh, the CEO of the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada. So welcome, uh, Robert and Keith. Uh, welcome to this uh, panel. Um, so we um, are going to explore um, what is community-based tourism uh, in the reality of all of, in the countries of all of our speakers. Um, and we are going to uh, explore four subtopics, uh, which are um, what kind of uh, projects and recent projects uh, our speakers were involved in community-based tourism. Then we will explore what are the challenges that they have encountered and still are still in encountering uh, regarding this kind of tourism in their territories um, and how uh, they are contributing to support local communities. Um, then we will explore what kind of, uh, less, uh, of lessons uh, our speakers have learned uh, according to their perspective and their reality in, in community-based tourism. And then at least we'll also um, get their vision and how we can, um, we can go through the new challenges, find maybe new strategies uh, and find maybe new way to commit better uh, to indigenous and local communities through uh, community-based tourism uh, in their country, traditional lands uh, and the world. Um, so to start, um, we are going to explore the first topic, which is, um, and I will give the floor to Anina Sandberg to start and then welcome all the speakers to follow and answer the, the, the question. So could you please, um, Anina, introduce your organization, explain what you're doing, and maybe give us a glimpse of what are the the most recent project that you you are you are involve yourself and visit natives uh, in community-based tourism. 
Okay, hello for everybody. My name is Anina Sandberg and I'm the founder of Visit Natives. And I'm from Finland, but we run tours in Tanzania and Norway. And at the moment I'm in Tanzania doing some field work. So I have a little bit low internet connection. So sorry if I um, don't hear well, but let's try to have a good connection. So what Visit Natives does, we uh, want to um, do tourism that benefits indigenous people. And we work in Norway and Tanzania. And these places, are there's lots of tourism because they're the lands of the indigenous people. But the problem is that they are not benefiting the indigenous people. So what we do, we bring travelers to stay with the indigenous families and communities. And in Norway, we work with Sami reindeer herders. And they are the only indigenous people in the European Union. And we bring their people to, for example, to join the reindeer migration. They join the Sami families and they explore uh, Norway very differently. And in Tanzania, we work with Maasai and Datoka uh, pastoralists near the Ngorongoro area, where there is lots of tourism that is not benefiting them. And also we work with Hatsabe hunter-gatherers. So we bring travelers there to stay in their own communities. And um, they stay in the families, they um, do the daily work of the people and get very, very immersive experience. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Anina. Um, that's a pleasure to have you with us today. So I'm very happy that you can share your, your views on uh, and, and your work also on the field. Um, Peter, can you please um, give us a glimpse of your own word, uh, what you are doing and what kind of projects you are involved? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, just to say, I absolutely love to go on a trip to Sami communities that sounds unbelievably interesting so yeah when, when COVID's finished that's on the list <laughs> um, my name's uh, Peter Richards and I have about uh, 20 years of experience uh, at the crossroads of responsible tourism and community development and uh, what I'm passionate about is facilitating partnerships um, between different tourism stakeholders especially communities and uh, tour guides and tour operators uh, to grow up, to basically create great local experiences which uh, create real local benefits. Um, the work is really about helping partners to understand and to balance each other's situations and expectations and positions. And quite often, you know, people's backgrounds give them a different position. And, and this looks like it's a disagreement, but it's just it's just the result of people's different life experiences. So if you can help people to understand each other and the different, different perspectives, then uh, lots of good things are possible. I have to uh, say that I'm, I'm not uh, myself uh, from an indigenous community. I feel extremely honored to be here on this panel. So thank you very, very much. You know, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, I am lucky enough to have had um, mentors uh, like here in Thailand. One of my greatest teachers is Pochana Suansi. She has 30 years of experience working with Thai communities. And so um, I was able to learn alongside her and I was really amazed by uh, the potential of using social work skills uh, as another toolkit to make you know, basically to, to, to benefit communities, but also to create you know, incredible experiences for visitors as well. Um, I'm one of the founders of Thailand Community Based Tourism Institute uh, since 2007. And now I'm working for ITC, the International Trade Center. And ITC is a UN organization and our mission is to help small and medium sized enterprises to benefit from global trade. And I've been working in Myanmar with, with a team, uh, which includes uh, Pochana and also our Myanmar colleagues and basically, we've been working in the uh, villages where the long neck uh, Karen live. And, uh, you know, long neck Karen in Southeast Asia is a very long story. So uh, these people, the Kayan, they uh, had to escape from war in Myanmar. And uh, they were actually stuck in kind of um, makeshift camps in Thailand. Tour operators were charging entrance fees. It became a kind of worst case scenario uh, example of cultural tourism. So in Myanmar, we had the chance to try to work alongside the people uh, to create a, just a more meaningful, more beneficial, and just a fully better uh, experience of meeting uh, the, the Cayenne people. And we did this through a supply chain approach, which you know is, I find extremely challenging and interesting. So working at each step along the supply chain, uh, from the villagers through to uh, regional license guides, local ground handlers, destination management companies, and national tour operators, and through to the market, trying to have an intervention at each point to help people understand each other and to help these experiences uh, move from a fully participatory process up to the market and actually be sold. 
And um, in the last three years, we've replicated that as a TOT or training of trainers process. So we've got uh, local trainers now who are able to do this. And so that's where we're at. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, that's very interesting to, to listen to all the, the um, well, so, so interesting and maybe intense project you're involved in. And um, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Judy, can you please share with us your, your, what you're doing and, and what are the, the recent projects you're involved in at the moment? Um, good evening from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Um, my name is Judy Kefagona. I am a founder of a uh, knowledge-based organization known as Sustainable Travel and Tourism Agenda. Our idea is to empower the tourism industry with good enough knowledge so that uh, we can all be better consumers and producers that what they put in the market, what the tourism puts in the market will add value to human life, to those who travel, and that those who consume it will consume it responsibly. Now, over the last uh, more than, before I set up STTA, I have been in this space where I have engaged with community in different, at different levels. In, in, in my early careers um, in sustainable tourism, I worked more with communities that uh, managed or owned community enterprises. And the big idea at that time was community had to own and manage. And so community-based tourism became defined as community uh, that is owned and managed by communities. But more and more we started seeing that uh, there was communities that were hosting a tourism without owning and managing. So the definition evolved and over time we saw it now change from community tourism, based tourism, meaning tourism that is uh, owned, managed, hosted or hosted by communities. In this age, in the last decade, um, when we're living in an, in an era of uh, 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 profound awareness, profound awareness about uh, the implications of our activities as human beings, the implications of individuals, the implications of businesses, the implications of governments and policies, and what it means for all of us to create places that are good enough for us to live in. With things like climate change and many other things happening today, we are living in an era of a pandemic. So with this profound uh, um, awareness, another addition to the whole idea of community-based tourism emerged. It was now the idea of tourism that is acceptable. Acceptable means we had to start putting boundaries. We had to start talking about boundaries. The tourism has got boundaries. There's, a, there's so far that we can go, even for the communities that are, are, are hosting tourism. There's an extent to which they should be allowed to put boundaries in tourism. And this is the whole concept of sustainability, that there's nothing like open consumption and there's nothing like open uh, production and open creation and open innovation. Everything now has got to be done within boundaries because humanity, human beings have realized that if we don't do things without some controls and some, and some boundaries, we're actually doing things that come back to limits our own existence. So in working in this particular space, in the early years, I realized that the emphasis, and even in places that I worked on, the emphasis was always that let's empower the communities so that communities can do tourism properly. There was always the criticism about uh, community-owned tourism, or they didn't meet the market standards, and all, because uh, tourism was about transforming what community has not actually offering what the community have and how they want to offer it. So we put a lot of effort in those years in trying to transform communities to meet market demands, not trying to educate the traveler to know that there are certain things that can just be consumed the way they are. You don't have to consume a tourism, a community product like you would consume it at Kempinski. Don't expect the Kempinski standards expects a community experience. When you go to Kempinski, you get the Kempinski experience. 
Kempinski cannot give you a community experience. And so that became my message in my organization over the last seven years. I have had an agenda not to transform the community, but to transform the thinking of the tourism industry, to transform the thinking of the traveler, to transform the industry on how they engage with the community, that their type of engagement with the community can result in an exciting um, uh, encounter for the travelers because the, the community will welcome the, 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 the visitors, the guests, the tourists will be treated as guests. They will not be tourists, but that depends on how tourism engages with community. So over the last uh, um, uh, three years, I have spent time trying to develop uh, training and communication material to help the tourism industry understand that their type of engagement can hurt a community and bring risks to a community. At the same time, if it is done properly, everybody can thrive. The tourism businesses can thrive, the communities can thrive, and we can create great places to visit that are great places to live in. Thank you. Very good, Judy. Thank you very much. And it's uh, all the more pleasure to, be, to, to have you in this panel uh, today since we, we, we had planned to, to be together on another panel last March. We were supposed to be at the ITB for the Indigenous uh, Tourism Seminar together. But uh, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, everything was canceled. So it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, Robert, uh, Taylor, can you please uh, give us uh, also your views, uh, tell us more about why talk and uh, what are the recent projects you are involved in at the moment? Sure, thanks, Arlie. Um, well, I'm the CEO of Waitok, so I'm, uh, I'm Nanda, which is uh, from the Yamaji Nation in the Midwest of uh, Australia. And Waitok has uh, been working for around 20 years now in uh, supporting Aboriginal tourism across Australia. We, um, we, as you're probably aware, we were going to have the World Indigenous Tourism Summit here in uh, Perth in Western Australia, but due to COVID that was also... Uh, postponed, which we're looking at having that in November 2021. Hopefully by then we'll be able to have international visitors back into Australia. So we're really looking forward to, um, to holding that event as well. Um, we've we've uh, been running an Aboriginal tourism development program for the last five years and it's been very successful and it is a shame that COVID has come along because over the last uh, five years we've created 40 new businesses, Aboriginal tourism businesses across our state and 104 full-time jobs were created out of that. And now it's going the other way. We haven't lost too many uh, businesses, even though our government did close our communities uh, due to the risk on some of the elders in our communities. Uh, they, What we did to support them is we made sure that Waitok uh, moved its staff around. We used some state government staff also to ring and contact every member that we had in, uh, in our membership around WA and just talk to them to find out what they needed. Our state government put some great programs in place where they actually uh, put up some survival grants for our businesses as well. So our Aboriginal tourism businesses could apply for six and a half thousand dollars in funds to help them get through uh, a tough time. And also then there was an, another grant after that, which you could claim up to a hundred thousand dollars per business as well. So they've supported over a thousand businesses across the state in tourism, which has been really helpful. And our, our premier has been very strong in uh, keeping our borders closed uh, at the moment, even to the other states. Uh, so that we don't get any, uh, you know, cross contact uh, movement in uh, COVID. It's been um, quite well received in our state, but other states have been not, not too impressed that they can't come over to WA and we can't travel out, but it's being held at the moment, our hard borders. So our development program has been very successful and we've also seen a lot of our um, businesses during COVID uh, we supported them by letting them make small videos of what they're doing. So they've been out doing their normal um, hunting, fishing, gathering, all those sorts of things they would, would have done if there wasn't tourists there uh, and being able to survive on the normal things they would have done before, you know, colonisation even happened. So a lot of that, that hunting and gathering, we asked them to film 
And then we, we made a series called Postcards in Your Backyard that we uh, put out on social media just to keep people interested in the Aboriginal tourism businesses, and that was very successful as well. And we ran a um, competition where you could choose your best postcard that you liked, and then we've given out uh, $10,000 worth of vouchers, which then gives money back into the tourism businesses. Uh, and the state government have also been running a campaign uh, which has been called... Um, uh, basically staying in your own backyard as well. So people haven't um, been go able to go out to other countries or out of the state. So they've been calling them a staycation <laughs> instead of a vacation. So, yeah, we've had a lot of uh, Western Australians travelling around their own state to places they've never be even been before. So it's been um, reasonably successful over the past two or three months, um, even though COVID has hit pretty hard because our northern part of Australia... Uh, only has a very short season due to um, weather, due to wet season, monsoons, um, cyclones, etc. Uh, so they only got about three months of their season, which was pretty devastating. But they um, have been able to get support from our state government. Thank you very much, Robert. That will also make the bridge to the next topic about the challenges that you uh, all encountering, but uh, we will also end this introduction with uh, Keith, Henry, and, and Keith, uh, welcome to the panel. Uh, we are happy to have you here. Um, can you please um, give us an introduction of uh, what you are doing at the moment at ITAC? And if you want, you, you can also, I think all the recent projects you are involved at the moment, of course, are connected to what is happening due to the pandemic and the, this whole uh, very special situation. So please also, uh, I mean, you can also go on with developing all the, the challenges that you are living through uh, due to the lockdown in regarding community-based tourism. Sure, well, thanks. Uh, it's an honor to be on the panel today. My name is uh, Keith Henry. I'm the President and CEO for the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada. I am a Métis person, one of the three main Indigenous peoples in Canada. There's First Nation, Métis, and Inuit. And I'm actually joining you from Vancouver, not where I'm from originally, but uh, uh, a Coast Salish territory with uh, a lot of rich history with the local First Nations here uh, in British Columbia on the west coast of Canada. Uh, but our organization, just to give a little context, uh, we are a national organization. Uh, we support the development of Indigenous tourism across the country and uh, uh, we're Indigenous owned and operated. Our board is uh, one Indigenous representative from every province and territory. We're not government. Uh, we work exclusively with our you know, roughly 630 First Nation communities with uh, a number of Métis settlements and the Inuit in the north and all their sort of local communities. And we have a very large urban uh, Indigenous population, which uh, we're trying to serve there and give, show them that tourism is a logical opportunity for their culture in many ways. So uh, we right now we have about 1800 businesses. Uh, some are large hotels, uh, cultural centers, outdoor adventure restaurants, a, a really wide range of small entrepreneurially owned businesses to large community owned enterprises uh, that are quite sophisticated. And Indigenous tourism has been growing in our country for about 30 years. So our role as a national body has really been to help continue that um, growth uh, through a variety of plans, tactics and strategies. So having said that, uh, you know, we face pretty challenging times. Uh, we were, 2019 was our best year ever, uh, just to give everyone a sense of the size of our industry. Uh, we were about $2 billion in direct GDP. We had 40,000 people working in our businesses. Uh, and as I said, some of these businesses were um, quite sustainable. Uh, you know, we had a number of uh, businesses that were evolving because of the growth and interest in Indigenous tourism. For example, in the last four years, we had about 400 startup businesses uh, that we helped incubate across the country. So these are a lot of, we were seeing a tremendous growth in 2019 that um, up until December. So 2020 was certainly poised to be a tremendous year for us. We were, we were growing at a rate of about 20 to 25% a, a year with both domestic and international visitation growing quite rapidly. And part of that is because we've taken a really strong approach in Canada to really understand the market 
And as much as I would like to say the market will adjust to our Indigenous communities, we learned uh, through a lot of trials and tribulations that we also have to adjust to what the market conditions are. We have to understand how we're packaging. We have to understand how the sales channels work. And we took a more streamlined approach on trying to work with industry. So partners like Destination Canada, you know, many of our, our layers of marketing organizations in Canada. And that was really, a, a, I think, a, quite a turning point for our industry a, a number of years ago. And so that's really helped us grow tremendously. Now, I, you know, we've done a lot of community-based tourism work. Uh, we've created standards. We've created national manuals and guidelines. And so we've created a lot of what we call it, uh, toolkits um, for the communities as they start from startup to just have concept idea, building out a, a thought, a process. We've got checklists, balance, you know, things that we just make it really simple for the local community economic development officer and leadership to think of like, what's the actual, where do we start? And so we've, we've created a lot of these tools on our, and it's at indigenoustourism.ca forward slash corporate if people want to look at it. It's called the National Manual for Market Readiness and Authenticity. So we've created, and that's just one example, we've created a lot of these kind of tools to get our industry to the place we were today. So we've done that. We've done, uh, the other thing we've tried to do is work with marketing partners about, you know, one thing we all have in common, we all come from beautiful countries. We all come, we have lots of, you know, probably beautiful water, maybe mountains. We have a lot of like environmental assets, but what we, what we've really been able to help the industry here in Canada understand that what makes Canada different is that indigenous presence. It's not just Canada with RCMP officers and beavers and maple syrup and the things that our industry did really rely heavily on uh, promoting Canada in a lot of ways internationally. So we've really been done a part of the other side of the work we've done is really help shape what's different about Canada and what and when we saw our marketing partners realize that we're not competitive with them that we want to work with them to make Canada even a more attractive destination it really turned the corner for us so um you know all that to say that we've done lots of community development whether it's you know in the east coast with torn gats and the inuit people on, on, on northern labrador where this is the most remote location that anyone could find in the world quite honestly i know there's a lot of remote locations but it's several legs to get there. Uh, it's in a national park for us in Canada, where we've helped continue to support the, the Nunatsiavut people and they're in the local Inuit communities, develop a you know sort of an outdoor adventure, really one of the last safaris in Canada to right to urban centers, right? You know, uh, whether that's in, I know, Oriel, you've been to Quebec and Wendaki and the work that's been done there or Haida Gwaii in British Columbia. So, I mean, the list is kind of quite, like we've gone from rural remote locations and how could we move visitors and how do we come up with a plan to support the communities to, you know, all the way across, across the, I guess, spectrum. So, uh, you know, I know we're going to get into some of the impacts today, but I mean, it's been such an exciting, I guess, trajectory for us. Uh, we as a national body have done, uh, uh, we're quite proud of the work in, in, the, in the growth we saw in, in Indigenous tourism, in tourism Canada. And I will end with this for setting the context. What Canada and our, and our, our layers of provincial, territorial, local, municipal marketing organizations realize that when they really put some legwork behind helping market and promote Indigenous tourism, uh, we were outpacing every single other sector in growth. And it, it wasn't just because there was new consumers. What people wanted, they just weren't sure where to find local indigenous tourism. And when we all help to make it easier for the consumers, it, it really changed the landscape. And so tourism was growing, grew over three years. We did a, an assessment of this last year. Tourism grew 14% roughly across the board in Canada over those three years. We grew, we grew about 24%. So, and nothing really changed. The visitor volume hadn't really changed. What it was, was that the actual the way we were marketing amongst partners was was uh, dramatically changed. So, um, you know, I'll just leave it at that for my opening comments. Thank you very much, Keith, for this presentation. Um, um, now uh, we can go also through the, the, the challenges that you have started uh, to, to, to mention. Uh, and in this special time that we are uh, going through, um, how all of your uh, companies, organizations are, are, are doing um, 
uh, are using their creativity to <laughs> to to support the the challenges uh, that they are facing at the moment. Um, if you want, Keith, you can go on with this, and then I will give back the the floor to Anina. Thank you. Sure. Well, thanks. I mean, um, for all of us, we knew we know that tourism was the first hit, the hardest hit, and it will be the last to recover. In Canada, that's been very true. Our tourism sector, out of all the economic sectors, Indigenous or not, tourism felt it right away, and we're feeling it significantly right now, and it's taking longer to recover. And so, um, you know, we were having a record-breaking year I was just talking about. Now we've had record-breaking collapse. You know, we had about 1,800 businesses uh, um, that uh, were up and running. Uh, we estimate we're going to lose at least seven to 800, if not more, of those businesses uh, by the by November. Um, there's just been zero revenue. Uh, most of the, the and the challenge we got is twofold. One, Canada relied heavily on a lot of international visitors from the U.S., from Japan, from China, from France, from Germany and U.K they were the largest spending visitor volumes for our businesses, if I can say it that way. Well, we know now today that for Canada, those borders are all closed. And there was the thought that when, when COVID first started that, that by the fall, we might be able to start to rebuild. And, and that's just simply not the case with the second wave now really starting to impact Canada. So that's, that's one thing. But on the other side, what has happened now, it took us many years to build indigenous community positive sentiment about tourism. Now COVID, and because viruses have had a devastating impact on Indigenous communities in Canada, it has wiped out just about like hundreds of thousands of Indigenous people in this country only 100 to 150 years ago. So these are fresh thoughts in the elders' minds and in the people we're working with, and it, it impacts. So right now, what we have, we, we've we've done some, um, I guess, surveying. And about half our communities in Canada are really uncomfortable welcoming visitors back, even if they can reopen. So now we're trying to deal with how are we going to get, if I can say, Indigenous social license. So as we recover, it's not just a matter of borders reopening and people can travel again. It, we're going to have to really rebuild the sentiment that we can open safely and that, you know, this is uh, something that we need to, these are the measures we need to do that we can do this properly and appropriately. So we've created, so some of the things we've done around this, so we've created standards for COVID-19 sort of safety standards and guidelines. We've created, a, uh, I guess, a, 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 a procedure manual, regardless of which sector, when we've put that out to our businesses and to our communities, we're hoping as we get past the sort of continued shock of, of the, the closure, we'll, we'll get to that place. We've also been working with the government of Canada, who's been a great partner to us. Uh, we have been, we've developed a stimulus grant program. So we are helping businesses with up to $25,000 grants to sort of weather the storm of COVID-19 to help keep their doors open a little bit. It's not a huge amount of money, but it helps. So we've helped right now about $16 million in funds for our businesses to keep them afloat, as many of them afloat. We're worried that if they completely shut down, some of these just will not come back. I mean, it's just a, it's just a, a simple fact. I and mean, it's taken us 30 years to get to 1,800 businesses. And so we don't want to lose 800 to 1,000 of these. So we've, we've done the grant process. We've also been able to work with the government of Canada to extend what we have here in Canada. It's called the Emergency Wage Subsidy Program. So last week, we were or two weeks ago, we were finally able to work with the government to extend wage subsidy to keep the employees of our Indigenous businesses attached to the business, even if there isn't a lot of, you know, sustainability to pay for the employees. So, so Canada uh, has agreed to extend the wage subsidy till now till basically the spring of 2021, which is going to help keep employees from moving on to other sectors. I mean, you know, the worst thing we have in Canada, we have such a large workforce that you know, when visitors uh, in the future come from the U.S. or anywhere else for that matter, when they go to an Indigenous experience, they're going to want to see an Indigenous person there. It, it does very little to sell Indigenous tourism when it's not Indigenous people potentially working there. And so we're trying to keep those trained employees that are that, that have been invested in millions over the years to keep them attached. So that's another, I guess, um, step. The third thing we're doing is we've we've launched a series of sort of domestic marketing uh, activities over the summer to try and you know uh, move Canadians around our country a little more effectively. We did a campaign called Escape from Home. 
uh, we launched a, a new online platform for consumers called Destination Indigenous. And there was a whole series of, 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 of tactics around that, you know, but that, that did have its challenges because um, Canadians themselves can't even freely travel amongst province to province or territory. There's actually, you know, uh, travel restrictions even within our own country. So that's been a real challenge for us, but we have done the marketing side domestically and we intend to continue that work. And I would say the last thing we're pushing on right now, uh, we do have a recovery strategy until 2024. We do have a well thought out plan, but um, one of the issues that is that is really paramount to that recovery is that um, we need to help our businesses to find other financial tools. Um, you know, whether the community owned or entrepreneurially owned, uh, the banks and everyone, Canada has done a certain amount of um, backstopping for loans, but the, it's only 80%. And what's happening is whether we have various institutions, you can borrow money to refinance and just sort of weather the storm in addition to our 25,000. You know, um, we're just trying to work with the banks or the government can't to backstop these loans for 100% because the banks aren't, they're not approving tourism. They're, they're using the, those programs for other sectors uh, because tourism is seen as too risky. And so we really got a lot of like a, a lot of significant challenges to sustain the sector in Canada. And it, it the impacts are real. Um, just to again, I don't want to be all doom and gloom, but you know, we I talked about the number of business losses. Uh, uh, as of as of August, we estimate we lost twenty one thousand people working out of the forty thousand. Um, so it it's it's a significant impact. And our and our belief is that if we don't re implement other recovery tactics that we're working trying to negotiate with Canada right now for our, our actual recovery plan, you know, it took thirty years to build. It's going to take maybe, you know, one or two years to destroy and it may take another 30 to rebuild. So we got a choice in Canada that we've been saying to our partners, either sustain it and support it or, you know, the system's going to pay one way or another. People that don't have the jobs, they go on social assistance, they go on other federally funded programs. It, it's a choice about how we want to position uh, what we want to do with Indigenous tourism. So. Um, that's really the challenge we have. And uh, right now, I just want to say that we're not seeing the light. Uh, it's taking longer because Canada's going through a very significant second wave right now. It's worse than people thought. And we had all thought the U.S. border would open by the fall. And those, those like none of that's happening. So um, it's pretty challenging times for us. And we're doing all we can to keep our businesses afloat. Thank you very much, Keith, for your, your testimony on this. And, and we also share, I um, mean, your... Um, the 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 worry that that we can all have on on families who are depending on those uh, businesses to survive and so so all thought out with your your people as well. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anina. Uh, as as the CEO of Visit Natives, um, and you are on the field at the moment with uh, Indigenous people. Uh, can you share with us what kind of challenges? Uh, Visit Native's um, um, team has been through uh, during the COVID, COVID time. I don't know if Anina is here. Maybe she's disconnected. Anina, are you here? Maybe not. I will give her the floor when she comes back. <laughs> Okay, um, so maybe Peter, can you share with us uh, what what kind of challenges you have seen and you have encountered uh, during the, the lockdown, for example, and, and how you and your team have contributed to support local communities? Okay, I mean, I mean thank, thank you very much, uh, Aurelie. Yeah, I generally, uh, just like everywhere else, COVID is a complete disaster. I mean, it's just an <laughs> unprecedented, right? Everyone's using this word, but it really is. It's just an unprecedented disaster. And uh, back in uh, March and April in our team, we were thinking that by this time now, you know, we'd at least have domestic markets fully back engaged and, you know, hopefully beginning to do uh, regional marketing and there will be travel bridges and travel bubbles and all these different initiatives which were being discussed and really nothing, you know, nothing has happened. And uh, just as Keith was saying, you know, we're being hit now by the second wave. In, in Thailand, the Thai government have been extremely strict and they, they did a good job of, of controlling the spread of COVID. Um, there's been huge uh, economic uh, consequences of that. But OK, in terms of protecting the population, they've done a really good job. 
uh, in Myanmar, uh, COVID kind of didn't appear to be taking a hold and uh, domestic tourism started uh, again. Uh, and now just in the last couple of weeks here, yeah, the second wave has come and the number's going up. So it's, it's, it's really, really sad. Um, in terms of how it's affected my work, I, I'm generally working with uh, remote rural communities. It's kind of a traditional CBT uh, situation. Uh, at the end of 2019, we'd, um, we, we, the, our project was in two phases. So to start with, we were working in the, the center of uh, Myanmar in, in the Kaya state. And then uh, we replicated this project in the south of Myanmar. So we just had our, our third season um, of uh, tourism uh, in Kaya state. Uh, more than 100 international tour operators were selling our, our experiences. Uh, you know, it, I mean, things were, were, were looking really, really good. 7,000 visitors, which for us uh, in this uh, context is a fantastic uh, numbers. And then at the end of uh, October, we had a, a fam trip um, to our new uh, experiences in the way. And these are really interesting experiences because um, in Kaya, Kaya is a kind of classic, very, very cultural, deep green CBT experience. But in the way, uh, it's down on the Andaman coast, you know, that this, uh, um, uh, natural environments quite close to quite similar to Phuket but this area is completely virgin it's, it's absolutely beautiful so we knew that we were going to um, have leisure travelers there in the future so we tried to develop uh, a more kind of leisure-based community-based tourism experiences uh, such as a barefoot forest spa and a sunset beach picnic uh, produced by the local ladies in the communities and we had 28 tour operators on our fan trip and it was like it was fantastic you know, everyone had a fantastic time Oh, the sky's the limit, off we go. And uh, yeah, everything was just uh, blown out of the water, which was extreme, extremely sad. So, so what, what have we been doing? Uh, we've been trying to use our time as, as best as we possibly can. Um, we, we're lucky that we used the training of trainers process um, during our project. So from the very beginning, we thought about, okay, how are we going to ensure sustainability? We have to ensure um, skill transfer. So we work with the you know, young people in the destinations. We invited young professionals to come and literally join us you know, whenever they wanted to on the job in the field. And then we formalized that in the last three years as a, as a systematic training of trainers process. So we have been able to do online training because TOTs are, are, are smart enough and you know, tech savvy enough to be able to do online training. But up until two weeks ago, they were still able to go to the communities and then implement the TOT actually in the field. But in the last two weeks, they haven't been able to do that anymore. So this is a new a new challenge for us now. Um, so yeah, I guess you know one of the big lessons learned there is is that you know TOT was was doubly useful in, in the end. Um, one of the key concerns that we have is that uh, we have this mantra in sustainable tourism about you know tourism for community benefits. And this is true. I mean, we do know that, of course, that tourism can create great benefits for communities. But the situation now is that the communities that we're working in uh, kind of in a strange way, they have a more diversified economy and they're actually more resilient uh, to COVID than the people who are at the bottom of the, the tourism supply food chain. So there's quite a lot of pressure from tour guides and tour operators who have lost all their business. And, you know, understandably, they're just desperate to get tourism running again uh, to initiate tours back to the communities and and they're using the language of sustainable tourism like you know we have to help to create benefits for, for, for the local communities and i think there is some sincerity there but it's also motivated by their own kind of desperation and so we have a similar uh, situation um, to what robert was talking about where many villages actually don't want to open yet you know some do and some don't that, that's the reality of the situation so we've also been working on tools. Um, we have uh, uh, COVID safety guidelines for community visits, which was just finished last week, and that will be available on our Facebook, uh, Myanmar Inclusive Tourism Project Facebook to share as well. Um, and uh, we have trainings planned, um, uh, again, through TOT, uh, through training of trainers for our field team uh, to implement these guidelines. And we're also gonna do training for local ground handlers and regional tour guides and uh, DMCs in, in Yangon, but everything really depends on uh, people being able to go back to the villages, even as a tra even as trainers, if not tourists. So that's where we're at now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for your your testimony on the situation. Um, I Anina has come back, so <laughs> I will be able to give you the floor, Anina, to to share with us 
um, what are actually the challenges that you've been through with visit natives in those special times with, uh, I mean, regarding the lockdown and the COVID situation and how you and your partners have contributed to support local communities. Um, yes, so we, we are eager to hear you about those uh, points. Okay, thank you. Uh, my introduction was very short, so I would like to tell you a little bit about our traveling concept. So we are very much a, a grassroots level travel or tour operator, and we work in two countries with few indigenous communities. And I'm the only non-indigenous worker. And the idea to uh, found Visit Natives was because I studied African studies and I did my one, uh, one year um, field research among the Maasai and it changed my life. And when I came back, I realized like, why can't we have uh, traveling experiences that it's so immersive and have positive impact. So that was the idea to create Visit Natives, to create something very, very much um, grassroots level, like uh, staying with uh, native families. So that is our concept. And we work in Norway with Sami reindeer herders. And even Tanzania and Norway are very different countries. So in Norway, um, it's a wealthy country, but then indigenous people are facing uh, similar challenges and they are not many more full-time reindeer herders. So our aim in um, Norway is to help the reindeer herders to be full-time reindeer herders. So, and in Tanzania instead, we, we look for very, very remote locations and we work with um, families with women who are widows or girls who are school dropouts, we really want to have a positive impact on those remote villages. So the challenges were before pandemic to, we have beautiful locations, but we work in very remote places where are no toilets and, you know, anyway, this is tourism. So we need to have some kind of quality. And we be working very much because all our tours are managed and run and developed by the indigenous people. So uh, we started very well and we our concept was working and we had like different indigenous communities in Tanzania and in Norway, but then came the pandemic. So what it happens to us, of course, we um, we didn't have any tours until now, you know, Tanzania is welcoming visitors, but it comes very slowly, slowly. So we will have to put the COVID guidelines. But what I see in practice, uh, what are the challenges is that we can have beautiful guidelines, but when we go, and this is also maybe it's not going to change fast. COVID will last for many, I don't know until when. So that we have to think for long term. And we have the guidelines, but when you're on the field, you go into like uh, community based tourism is about being with the people. We bring travelers to stay with the families. We want to cook together. We want to sit on the campfire. We want to feel the connection. We want to have immersive experience. And it means um, that wearing a mask, social distancing, this is very challenging. And we need to find a way to. Um, create experiences that we can do safely and still have the immersive experience. So I hope that we can find a way that these guidelines will not only be in a paper, because also it said like COVID is spread among families. And we are aware when we go to supermarket, we wear the mask and we are very careful with our hands. But when we are home with the people we care, we forget it. And this is also happening, I'm, I'm afraid that community-based tourism, we want to be in the village, you spend, you spend one week in a village, you get to know the people, so we need to make sure that it's safe, it's safe for the host and it's safe for the traveler. So I think this is something we have to think in the long term, how we can make this happening, because it's all about connecting with the people. And but what we did for our business uh, recently is we created like online courses. So uh, we have experiences that are based on um, indigenous wisdom or uh, traditional, all these traditional things that we customs, rituals, and we uh, made some online courses and then the traveler can make the course online. It, it's a different product, but we also found some market to sell the products for schools, universities. You know, it can be also because a training material that the indigenous people are giving their aspects about nature conversation, 
so it can be um, also very educative, educative material. And then we um, did some online performances. So the indigenous people, it's only about one hour because, you know, traveling and watching, I, I personally don't like much online experiences because you work all day with the computer and it's not the, not the same relaxing experience to maybe to have a long online course, but one hour is very beautiful. You can, you can see the dancing, you can, you can feel, feel the thing when you kind of travel. So this was, we did uh, during the lockdown we had these um, online performances and they were very successful. And they also like uh, the price is not high. So people who maybe would not travel with us uh, bought the experience. And this was very important for our Tanzanian communities because I felt very bad. We have been creating many communities, work very hard and they were expecting to host the travelers and then gave the COVID. And we told them that we are having these travelers and then we would need to cancel. And there was, I mean, they are facing many, many issues like hunger and lack of basic needs. So with this help of these uh, perform, um, online performances, we bought health insurance for over 100 families in Tanzania. And I think it was um, very, very important to show them that we, we didn't abandon them, even we didn't bring the travelers there. And we also developed food aid for the most, um, the most uh, the families most in need so this is what we have done so far and as i told we are very very grassroots level so we 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 work with the with the families and um now we are looking forward to how we can continue to do this safely and i think as i said earlier that this is maybe we say that when the pandemic is over the sustainable tourism will race and will change the world but it's also we have to think how how to do it in hand in hand with these COVID uh, guidelines so that's something that I am looking forward also to discuss with others how we can do this together. Absolutely Janina thank you very much uh, uh, just to, to give a, a short uh, input from my own experience as a as, um, founder of Native Immersion um, uh, Visit Natives and Native Immersion have uh, I've started a collaboration together uh, in the ID to create a kind of traveler toolkit, a traveler kit uh, that is uh, also giving um, a very deep um, service to travelers so that they get uh, the, full, um, the full support to understand and get prepared uh, to the indigenous experiences before they go to indigenous communities because uh, we have to give a lot of uh, energy into education, um, most of all in, in places where uh, indigenous people are, it's not the most vulnerable, but are the most, um, I mean, maybe sometimes not uh, that close to uh, the Western world. And um, it's important also to, um, to give room uh, for the people to be able to express uh, when they have uh, lived a cultural shock, uh, living an immersive experience, a deep immersive experience with indigenous people so that they can understand and then translate their experience into something they can do uh, with getting more uh, committed to their own land when they get back home. And I think that um, uh, the experience with indigenous people is, is the, that what makes it so powerful through the community-based tourism. It's to, as we also mentioned this before, we're just, we're not tourists anymore. Uh, we, we are like in a visitor uh, and host relationship. And this is what makes it so unbelievable. And uh, well, I, I wanted to give this in, this uh, input to our to our our project together because uh, and and during the pandemic, uh, what what we try to do also is to give the opportunity to uh, keep contact with indigenous people in communities and try to uh, also build a kind of business model through uh, online connection to transform indigenous um, operators as uh, educators of travelers 
Um, and so that's why we, we have tried to explore uh, ideas of um, offering online courses, online experiences with indigenous people uh, that will be a step uh, or preparation before they meet in person uh, when the situation with the pandemic uh, is over, hopefully. Um, so now I would like to listen to uh, Judy about uh, the challenges uh, you have encountered and how you have contributed to support the local communities. Um, yes, so Judy, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, when I introduced myself, I did not mention that I chair two boards of um, community uh, organizations that work in conservation and tourism based out of Pasaibara. So I chair a community wildlife uh, uh, conservancy, conservation area, which is a tourism uh, enterprise owned by the community and co-managed by um, tourism investors. I equally chair a board of our, of our community uh, empowerment organization that works out of um, Masai Mara in Kenya, which is a tourism destination. But this other organization um, looks at the gaps between uh, 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 tourism and community needs and tries to work with tourism to identify the right areas of intervention where tourism can make meaningful contribution to the lives of the uh, community. So it's very interesting to sit in an organization that does tourism and chair it. And another one is trying to uh, provide the link and uh, in the spaces where, where tourism has not been effective or just bringing to the awareness of tourism. that this is some of the interventions you can engage in in this community that will bring um, um, meaningful uh, transformation of lives in this uh, area. So um, uh, I'll start with an overview of, uh, of impact of, of COVID in, in community tourism in general in Kenya. Then I will give specific examples of how the, the, the community uh, conservation area where I sit as the chair, as we have some of the things that we have done to help the community during this um, uh, during this time. Now, I think uh, as a country, um, uh, one of the lessons that we have learned during this time is that many of uh, community-based enterprises are very small enterprises and medium or small to medium enterprises. Only a small percentage have reached maturity in terms of business development and are standing alone as uh, significantly large enterprises. And the community conservancy that I share is actually a significantly large limited company, um, uh, which, which, which operates with um, uh, everything, the legal structures and the systems, and it's huge. And it has a, a, a very big board, a very diverse board, which means it, it can compete with many, what I will call many big employers in the country today. Yet I have also engaged with very small, uh, very, very small uh, community-based tourism enterprises. Some are owned at family level, some are just at village level. Some uh, slightly extend outside of the village, but a large percentage of them that are, that are community owned and community managed are very small or small enterprises. Now, most of these enterprises fall within in, 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 in our country they fall between the category of businesses that are called informal. Informal, which means that they try their best, but they're not able to comply with all regulatory requirements. They do the basic, they get the license to operate um, uh, tourism, and they can go as far as opening, getting a business name, so they have a license and they can open a bank account. And they are allowed, in a, to a certain extent, they can they can enter into a transactional uh, deal with another operator. But most of them are not even able to do that because they don't have the tax registration system. They are not registered with the tax authorities because they are not able in their small businesses to keep their books properly and make returns, annual returns to the tax authority. 
So they remain very informal, which hinders them from growing because they are unable to enter into partnership, even with tour operators to sign uh, contractual deals for promotion becomes a problem because the tour operator says, I want to see your, your value added tax certificate. I want to see your exemption certificate. I want to see your certificate of, of, of confirmation that you are tax compliant so that when I do business with you, I can be able to claim back my VAT, what we call it here, value added tax. So because of those limitations, you find that most of the CBTEs are in that category of informal businesses. And they stay in that place for a long time. So this, the category of CBTEs that are in the informal businesses were hard hit by this uh, pandemic. Why am I saying they were hard hit and doubly hit? Because those ones that are in the formal bracket were able to qualify for government uh, economic uh, stimulus packages. And the conservancy where the community conservancy where I sit as a board chair is a recipient of the government economic stimulus packages. But many thousands more and hundreds of thousands which might go out of business could not access this because they needed this documentation. Some of them are not even in the, in the main register of, of, of the tourism authority as, as qualified tourism businesses. So it is even difficult to tell who, how much they have lost because they are not even in the database in the first place. And yet they make the majority of the, of the experiences. Like all of you have mentioned, um, everybody loves tourism. The conservancy that I'm talking about, the community conserved area where I see is totally dependent on tourism. But what we did, which has kept the community going, what we did when we were designing this enterprise together with the community, we allowed for the continuation of the local livelihood, which is pastoralism. So this area was defined as a conservation area. Traditionally in Kenya, conservation areas do not allow for mixed use of land. But this, in this conservation area, we designed a model that allowed for mixed use of land, a compatible use with wildlife. So we found out that research had shown that wildlife and pastoralism go hand in hand, that wildlife and, and livestock can use the same spaces provided the grazing is managed so that they don't get too close to each other at different times to be able to pass diseases, especially from the wildebeest to the cows, it was possible for them to coexist. So when tourism collapsed, the community still had pastoralism and they were still able to take their livestock to the market. And so households, whereas their incomes went down, they could still depend on their livestock. They could still take their kids to school. They could still um, meet their day-to-day -day needs. So the model at the beginning had built in some resilience by continuing, by not cutting off local livelihoods, but integrating local livelihoods into the, 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 the tourism uh, uh, conservation model. So this cushioned, this has cushioned the community conservation area where that I work with. And what we've been able to receive apart from the government um, stimulus fund has also been a little bit of support from other conservation organizations like um, uh, Conservation International, like uh, USAID has now come in and supported every community conserved area that works on the same model where communities still own the land. So in this model, uh, communities still own the land, community livelihoods have been uh, maintained and supported. They still go on, they live alongside um, uh, the conservation areas, they have not been evicted. They have just opened, they are not putting fences. They have opened their land so that wildlife can move into the areas that are secluded, but they have not fenced off. So their lifestyles have continued, their livelihoods have continued. Wildlife and tourism has not taken over. Land still belongs to them. Tourism is only leasing these places. We did not allow for any tourism to buy and take over and anything that was community um, asset. So th the model building resilience that allowed local livelihoods to continue. So tourism was just another economic vehicle for the community. It did not take over community lives. So the resilience that was built there has kept some of this, uh, this community exam, the one that I work with where I sit in the board, it has kept us going uh, for a little bit. Now in between, in, within that model, 
or build some um, uh, what I call um, uh, social security measures. Other than the livelihoods and retention of land and, and, and uh, local livelihoods, there was monies that was supposed to be set aside out of tourism business that would act like some cushion fund that can carry forward when tourism, um, uh, when anything happens to tourism, there can be some money that the community can fall back to for a given period of time. This money has been able to help uh, with the uh, uh, support of payments of uh, salaries for those who are working as rangers in these places. Now other organizations have come in to support, to pay for the rangers. So nobody working in the community conservancies lost their job during this time. The people working in the tourism lodges within the conservation areas lost their jobs. But the communities working directly in the conservation area as community rangers, not one of them lost their job. There has been a program uh, uh, to support them. So we've also learned another lesson that you can actually build resilience through the design of tourism when working with communities to avoid over dependence on one source of income for the community and build alternative livelihoods that are compatible with tourism in a certain area can be very, very, um, uh, beneficial to um, our community. So these are some of the lessons that uh, we have learned during this time. So what other things have we have we uh, been doing to, to support uh, additional things? Now I shift back to the organization that I, I run, which is called the STTA. At STTA, we have been trying to build more awareness on how to work with communities to build resilience, using examples of models that have worked, but also trying to caution. I, I think one of us has, has, has spoken about, um, sometimes you don't know where to draw the line, whether tourism is, is using communities during this time or is actually supporting them. And there's this thing that we've seen a lot from uh, emerging even stronger since the pandemic was announced, what we call social marketing that a lot of businesses have been out here saying that, no, if you don't come, if you don't come, the communities will be poorer. If you don't, if you don't, uh, uh, don't cancel, postpone, communities will be poorer. But they're saying these things and uh, some of them have even gone ahead to do crowdfunding from their clients without even talking to the communities that they're raising funds for. And this is when when, when tourism starts to, you know, when we start talking about ethical marketing and, and, and ethical ways of doing business, and we have been in the forefront of fighting in this space and saying, be ethical, do not use communities um, during this time. There are other ways that you can engage to support community-based tourism at this particular time. But when you go and do, and do crowdfunding, to pay for your own uh, ex expenses because you, you want to support your company to stay afloat and you're using the name of the company. This, this is what we call social marketing and it's actually an abuse of communities. So we've also been at that place of trying to fight for the rights of the community to defend their dignity and what they stand for by, by ensuring that they are not misused at this particular time by certain businesses to just raise money for their own um, Interest. Yes. So I've been on, on both sides of, of, of the coin trying to work with community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. That was very interesting to see um, that you, you've been through also all this kind of analysis to, uh, to, to see what kind of tools we need also to, to support indigenous and community based tourism in a more ethical way. Um, thank you very much. Um, we, I would like um, to give the floor to Robert, um, maybe because now um, regarding the time that we have left, uh, I will ask you just to maybe shorten it to three minutes, each of you. Um, you can share um, what are the, the main lessons learned uh, according to your perspectives and, and your reality in community-based tourism and maybe end up with also your vision of uh, CBD uh, in the post COVID 19 time, uh, we hope. Like what, what will be according to you, the new challenges, the new strategies uh, and commitment uh, you would like to, 
to, to, to get him to shape a new relationship uh, with community-based tourism uh, in, in your land. Um, so, Robert, I give it to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll try and keep it short because I've got to echo pretty much what a lot of people are saying anyway. Um, we've done a lot of things that um, Judy was mentioned as well. We have put dual, dual use in some of our pastoralisation. So we've got camping with custodian sites where people can go and camp on Aboriginal communities, but they can also run their cattle stations at the same time. Um, our, <coughs> our government did also do something similar to Canada. They put JobKeeper in to keep businesses running, uh, to keep staff on board. Uh, and also Job Seeker, which was basically to help um, people that were out of work to have a little bit more income than they would normally if they weren't working. Um, and, and part of that Job Seeker was to keep tra excuse me, training going. So they would get training as part of that paid training, which um, was helpful for them as well. Um, I guess the toughest thing community tourism is that for us is that our communities are vulnerable, that we are only 3% of the population of Australia um, due to colonisation. You know, there was a lot of stolen generation, uh, Aboriginal people taken away from their families and children. And, our, our, you know, through disease from colonisation, again, there's a lot of diabetes, a lot of heart issues and things like that. So the government did do the right thing, I think, in closing our communities. And again, as echoing what Keith said, it'll be a long time before communities are happy to bring people, uh, tourists and visitors back into their communities. Some of them that are running tourism businesses are small to medium as well. So they're not as hard hit. Our regions at the moment are very, very full because we've got a lot of people traveling out <clears throat> and the government have been really, and so we've been focusing on domestic marketing. The tough thing at the moment though, is the build coming back, it's gonna be very tough because our airlines at the moment are in devastation. Um, a lot of them aren't traveling across, let alone international, even between our own states. So I know that some of the bigger airlines um, in, in uh, Australia have put off more than half of their staff. Some of them are in, in debt of $9 billion plus. Our cruise, cruise industry is the same. It's all, all the cruise ships are being dismantled. It's going to be very tough for the cruise industry to come back with some of the things that happened uh, during this COVID period as well. But I guess for the future, all we can do is, um, again, use our COVID-19 support that we've been put in place. We did have a lot of COVID training for reopening of places. But I think at the moment, our regions are okay, but our cities, our city hotels are all closed. Uh, they're, they're just not coping at all and it'll be very difficult for a lot of them to reopen. A lot of them were COVID hotels, so they transferred across just to keep open, to keep money flowing in the doors. They had people in, in hotels that were coming in from other places so they could quarantine, but then, then it was a bigger ask for them to reopen. So at the moment, our city in Perth uh, and in other, other states are very hard hit as well. Um, but for the future, again, look, all we can do is try and, uh, you know, I don't think having virtual tours, even though um, we've had that try, uh, I don't think it's as good because as uh, I think Anina hit it on the head, it is about the experience and, you know, being with people, uh, being with the people, not watching them on, on a screen. Um, it's an immersive experience and I think that's important. So I think we've just got to push our way through the pandemic. Aboriginal people in Australia are very resilient in themselves uh, as well as all around the world. So I think we'll we'll come through. It'll just be a different world when we do. Keep it short. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert. Absolutely, we, we are living very special times and, and I think resilience is the real, um, I mean, the main topic that we are talking about at the moment and trying to find a way to have all communities resilient and maybe maybe find new ways also to to do tourism as judy said um, uh, diversity is very important and maybe we also have realized how dependent uh, our systems are on tourism and maybe we can work on it to invent a more diverse uh, system that will support sustainability but also um, protect communities from from being hit by another wave or of uh, another pandemic maybe in the future or any any other uh, um, any other um, challenge maybe linked to climate change so thank you very much robert i give it the floor to you anina sorry uh i missed keith my my apologies <laughs> oh 
you can go to an, okay. Anina. That's fine. Okay, I, as you as you like. <laughs> ladies first. Okay. <laughs> You're on mute. I don't, I'm um, now, okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so what I just would like to say shortly is that what I have learned and what we have learned on this indigenous uh, sustainable tourism business is that we started this that we wanted to have impact on the local community. And it's true. Like we gather the women in the groups and ask what they what they um, need and how what kind of issues we could solve with indigenous tourism. But the other thing we have that is um, that I have learned is that these kind of tourism have also impact on the traveler. So when the traveler goes to the place and when we educate the traveler, as Aurelia mentioned with the traveler toolkit, that the experience starts even before traveling and then the traveler go to the place and experience something that is very immersive is very very authentic and deep and build connections with the people and with the indigenous communities you always connect with nature so it changes um it might change your um way you think about consuming about climate change uh, it raises awareness so we have like a double impact on the both ways so i think that is good that is the good thing that the community-based tourism can have that was shortly <laughs> thank you very much anina uh, keith the floor is yours yeah i think the things i would say we've learned in canada is that um similar to what people have just said where Nina or Robert or others I mean it, it really is around ensuring that as you develop a, a, a community through tourism that there really is what we call in Canada more of a destination plan that, that a lot of the non-indigenous tourism sector uses it does us no good to build a one-off business in a local community we have to we we've taken the approach of a holistic planning with our communities there needs to be accommodations transportation food services we need to take care because visitors aren't going to you know go far off uh, out of their way to go visit something that may be one experience without other services in and around it so what i'm saying is that one of the lessons we've learned that it really needs to be a much more comprehensive approach to how communities are developing once you have social license in the indigenous community what is the overall strategy and plan it, it really shouldn't be a one-off the entrepreneurs the indigenous entrepreneurs will feed into that uh, and they will grow their businesses organically but we do need more of a destination management plan and, and we see that in the non-indigenous tourism sector across the world but we don't see enough of that specifically what i believe anyways and here in canada what we see um it just needs that needs to be one thing the second is there's not enough research we're all talking about a specific type of customer we all understand that but a lot of our communities, the leadership, the people that they don't really understand what we're going after. Cause it is more, there are those customers, there's other customers. What is the, what is the overall landscape of the potential of visitors coming to their community? Uh, you know, what are the services? So there needs to be more sp indigenous specific uh, tourism work. And we do a lot of that in Canada until, and I can tell you all until ITAC was doing that, and as leading that research, it wasn't being done. The, the mainstream tourism sector only does their research based on flight entries, hotel uh, overnight stays, and basic market volumes through the airports. I mean, so these are the things that, that we have to get, we got to get a layer of indigenous understanding around the research and the customer base and why we would do this. Because then the third point, if it isn't market driven and consumer demanded, then then all we're doing is creating a bunch of white elephants. And in Canada, that is something we don't support. We don't support building a business for the sake of building. Now, if we're gonna do it just to share culture, we have lots of cultural centers, but all of our, our communities have evolved in tourism for a lot of years. They wanna make sure that if they get more involved in indigenous tourism, that they're not left paying for a bunch of infrastructure that can't pay for itself. So that is a really important piece. So it's the three elements for me, and of course, you know, I, I guess I should ask the fourth, it, it needs to be authentic. I mean, and by authentic, we don't mean it's stuck in time or that we're, you know, from 300 years ago, people are running around and all they're doing is wearing, like indigenous people evolved. And what was contemporary 300 years ago, wasn't content, was not seen as, uh, you know, maybe as authentic at that time for the older generation at that time. What we're trying to get people to understand is indigenous people evolve we, we adjust with the climate, we adjust with the times, but we, we are having a serious 
identity issue in the tourism space because a lot of visitors still think if you come to Canada and see an Indigenous community, you're going to see someone get, you know, with some regalia right across the field on a horseback. And that's not like we got to stop feeding the stereotypes. We've got to help people understand that what's what's historical, what is traditional and what is contemporary, because we've got a lot of young up and coming Indigenous artists that are expressing themselves in a lot of different ways. So those are the lessons I would say are really important to us here in Canada. Thank you very, thank you very much, Keith. This is uh, an excellent point that you 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 mentioned, uh, and it's very important. Of course, uh, the indigenous word is is made of a lot of diversity, and we have to to also re remember this, and and that the community based tourism in indigenous communities can be done in many different ways, but connected to the reality of of people. And, and of course, uh, the contemporary um, reality is also part of it. And, and uh, um, I think that the connection between the tradition and the contemporary time are uh, the most interesting interaction that we can have all together. Also rem remembering uh, uh, of human roots from over the world. And uh, that's also important to, to see how Indigenous people can uh, also bring new perspective in the in the modern world. Thank you very much. Um, um, I have now we have now uh, Peter. Please uh, give us your views and your last word about uh, the, the the way and your vi your vision about community based tourism in the future. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Orly. Okay, it's, it's interesting because um, when I was thinking about this question, I actually thought about this question of, of authenticity. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, one thing which COVID does do really, really nicely is it shows very clearly that all of us are living in 2020. And yes, we have uh, different uh, cultures and societies and ways of life and so on, but there isn't anybody that's living back in time, which is such a huge expectation of so many visitors. And so you've got this idea of authenticity, which is basically like a, a fairy tale cocktail of expectations, which doesn't have any relevance, you know, often to, to people's real lives. And it's also, uh, you know, it's not it's not good for the communities because it's a burden of expectations, which is often often placed on the communities, and the tourists are disappointed with something that the communities themselves can't can't offer, you know, rather than their actual product and service and experience. Uh, and maybe in a way, COVID is an opportunity for us to explore that a bit. You know, I'm, I'm working, as, as I said, in the, the, the uh, long neck uh, Cayenne communities, and now the long neck ladies are wearing uh, face masks, you know. It's such a fantastic sort of shock, you know, you know, for, for, I mean, or well, it will be when the tourists come. And it's an opportunity to, yeah, to, to, to talk about these, these ideas and maybe, maybe to stop talking about authenticity and just talk more about uh, respect, uh, connection, experience. Um, Judy used the word encounter, you know, I think that these words create lower expectations, that they don't try to, uh, you know, entice us with some vision of a, of a bucolic past. Um, so yeah, you know, maybe, maybe, this, maybe this is the opportunity of COVID to show everybody, right, we're all in this together, actually. Uh, let's, let's not talk about authenticity anymore. Let's talk about respect, connection, experience and encounter. Thanks. Thank you very much to all of you and, and uh, uh, the topic of, of indigenous and community based tourism is, is, uh, is so diverse and so interesting to explore because of, uh, of all the, the, the wealth and diversity that it represents and uh, uh, something that um, emerged from, from the situation at the moment with, with the uh, kind of collapse of tourism. Uh, and, uh, and and maybe the projection of uh, what could be the future of tourism uh, is um, well seems to be really connected to how are we going to to do tourism in the future and how are we going to be more connected to uh, communities around the world and our own communities also uh, and and the pandemic has also taught us to uh, we explore our own communities uh, since we were uh, forced also to to stay in our uh, very close area, and um, that gave us the opportunity also to connect better with our neighbors and to 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 reconnect with our own 
uh, ancestry and the stories of our own families. And uh, uh, I think that for the future, that might be also uh, the, uh, the step to a new paradigm in tourism, in more connected to the cultural wealth of all communities around the world, uh, included people who also are part of, of uh, the I would say the colonialist countries also reconnecting to their own roots and be able to share those stories also with indigenous and local communities because this is what makes us uh, unique as human people and um, the, the more maybe conscious ways in, in doing travel, tourism in the future and uh, the importance of um, imagining new models uh, more committed to support local people um, in uh, at native immersion immersion we we are working on the concept of guardians guardians of the earth uh, to to talk about indigenous people uh, and and the role the 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 main role indigenous people have uh, around the world because they are located in uh, strategic places, uh, they are uh, participating to the balance of uh, the climate. Uh, they are protecting biodiversity around the world. And how, how can we connect travel to this, um, I would say, important mission that indigenous and local communities have to, uh, I mean, make a more sustainable world for the next generations? Um, and, and can we also involve the traveler into a more, uh, into a, a travel that is connected to the protection of the planet in the future through uh, the connection with indigenous and local communities? That may be a, a topic for the next time, but um, <laughs> thank you very much to all of you. Um, we have like Two minutes left, so it's time for uh, Pablo to take over. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us and sharing your um, your experience and your knowledge on uh, community-based tourism. It was a pleasure to moderate this panel, and I wish you all a great day or a great night, and hopefully uh, we will meet in person again, my friends. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot of you. It was very interested to to hear your your views and i think yeah i share with you that this is a good time uh, for education and for raising awareness and for building the future with uh, the communities more in the center i think we in the modern world need their their wisdom so i think it's it's time to build community around around this and put the those communities in the center. And well, thank you very much, uh, all of you. From some of you is the starting of the day, from some of, of you is the ending of the day. So uh, really, it's we really appreciate that all of you uh, have found the, the time to, to share this, this panel. Uh, and we look forward to, to meet you also in person sometime. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Thank or you night. very much. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye-bye.